Thanks for the download. My guest today is Mick Hawks, a former Commando Gunner and member of the Special Air Service. On this podcast, we discuss his Army career, including the Falklands War, volunteering for SAS selection, life and training in the regiment, his deployment to Bosnia, where he's captured by Serb forces alongside his mate Billy Billingham, the pace of operations for UKSF in Iraq and Afghanistan, sustaining SF manpower and a smaller army, and finally, his post-military professional life in private security. As usual, we'll finish off with Desert Island Dits, which is the guest choice of book, film and luxury item if they were marooned on a desert island. Don't forget to like, follow and share details of the podcast and leave a review wherever you get your podcast from. It doesn't take long and helps to bring it to the attention of a wider audience. Finally, if you enjoy the content, you can help with ongoing costs like website hosting and buy me a virtual coffee via our link in the show notes. Let's crack on. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Mick. Can you start by telling us what year you joined the Army and why you chose the Royal Artillery? Uh, thanks for the, for the invite, Colin. Much appreciated. I, I originally joined the Junior Parachute Regiment in September 1975. And straight away I got into gymnastics. So I joined the gym platoon and we travelled the country doing demonstrations, as you do as a young soldier. And then uh, when I went into normal recruit training, um, because as a junior you sort of joined week seven, I think it was at the time. In week 14, so two weeks after peak company, I snapped my ankle really badly. Um, to the extent it was pinned and I think the doctor was a bit overzealous so put on my records that I could never parachute again so my options were this, that and the other and I actually left the army because uh, as you know with parachute regiment guys you get uh, brainwashed somewhat and it was parachute regiment or nothing so I left for about six months realised that that was a big mistake went down to the recruiting office um, had a chat with the recruiting people down there And they said, listen, you're a fit lad, good report on Parachute Regiment. However, you know, it's got on your docks, Carl Parachute. Why don't you go and join a commando unit, Army Commando? So the the choice was engineers or Royal Artillery. So I decided to to join the Royal Artillery, Um, went down to Woolwich. Uh, When I went through training there, I thought it was a bit farcical because I I got best recruit, best shot and best gym, uh, which was a farce because I'd literally, you know, done quite a lot with the junior paras and, and recruit training. Uh, so I felt a bit guilty about taking that. And I was supposed to go to 2-9 straight away, but they only had one place available. And that went to a guy whose brother was in 2-9. Uh, uh, wasn't exactly very fit. Uh, he failed, so it was a waste of time. <laughs> uh, and I ended up going to 40 Field Regiment in Germany for about six months. Um, and 40 Field Regiment in Germany were the alcoholic regiment and I went to the alcoholic battery of the alcoholic, <laughs> alcoholic regiment so got into sport just to get me away from that drink culture so did cross country tug of war because uh, the uh, 44 were, were a really good tug of war team so I was in the catchweight division of the tug of war team uh, did a lot of football all that sort of stuff and then when the opportunity came I uh, I flicked across to do 2-9 and ended up in a cold wintry night going down to the Royal Citadel your attraction to the parachute regiment. Did you have a relative in the parachute regiment? Was your dad in it? No, not at all. My uh, my dad was uh, an out and out frackbat. Um, so, for those civilians <laughs> that listen to us, uh, it's uh, you know an organisation that wear blackberries and and don't actually do a lot. <laughs> but he was raw signals. So my inspiration for joining a crapout unit. <laughs> Um, uh, didn't didn't appeal at all because I I lived in Germany for uh, quite a long time with these drunken alcoholic units and the inspiration to join the military just wasn't there and all I ever wanted to do was be a footballer because I was very good at football and then when I was 15 and a half I had a trial with Lincoln City never got picked um, which as it happened was a good thing you know I'd have been a bang average fourth division player uh, so I then decided to join the army. As I went to Grimsby, there was a, <laughs> a big sergeant from a parachute regiment with a big picture behind him of people parachuted out of an aeroplane. And I just said, yeah, that's that's for me. Come in, son, sign on the, on the dotted line and away you go. Like, you know, so up I went to Brian and Barracks and, uh, in Aldershot and loved every minute. So you got to 2-9 and you did the commando course and we've covered the commando course and a couple of other the podcasts, but it's basically the commando course today is unchanged from the commando course that you did. And when you got to your first battery, what 
role were you in? What job did you do? Yeah, so I, I was quite lucky. Uh, so before I joined 2-9, I, I said I was in 40 Field Regiment, and because I was quite a fit lad, and they put me on the OP straight away, so I'd, I'd never been on the guns uh, in the artillery. So when I joined 2-9, they, uh, they had a, a slot open there on the OP, so I, I went straight in at the OPs, which was great, and, and thoroughly loved it, because we had a we had a great little team. There was three four-man teams in the OP party, um, and uh, generally you're, you're left on your own to, to, to do what you need to do. Were all the OP teams in 2-9 paratrained? Not at the time, although... Some were, there's quite a few that weren't, uh, and it, it's, it's quite funny, because my records can't parachute, blah, 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 and uh, I was on leave at the time, and the, the clerk, who obviously never read my documents, rang me up when I was on leave and said, oh, mate, there's a, a place on a paracourse, uh, do you fancy jumping on it? And I went, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I went, down, I went down to Bryce with a guy called Chris Summer. Uh, who's X148 battery, 79148 battery. So me and him were the two nine people on the course. Uh, did the paracord, no repercussions on my ankle at all, bearing in mind that my ankle was still pinned. Got back and, yeah, big relief that I could now parachute. But all down to a clerk who mistakenly said, you can do this paracord. So, uh, obviously the Falklands came up and we, we sort of went down there. And, uh, and it was good because... We were actually attached to the unit that we work with all the time. Down in Plymouth with 7, 9 and 8 battery, their commando groups that they work with are, are splattered all over the place. Whereas we're actually living with 4, 5 commandos. So that link and that, that closeness were, was very evident, if that makes sense. And, and that made it even better. I was with the Yankee Company, 4 5 Commando, which, which was great. Although I alluded to it earlier on, I've got a pin in my ankle. Um, However, during the Falklands campaign, because we all got issued low mounting boots um, and, and they caused me a lot of concern um, because it was round about the area where the pin was in my ankle. So I, I neglected to, to use these fancy boots and I used the old Northern Ireland patrol boot, which was reinforced cardboard, very lightweight. Um, as soon as you look at them, um, they fall apart. You know, they get wet. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But the good thing about it is they dry out very quickly. Whereas these fancy boots that Four Fiber issued and the rest of all the OPs, when they get wet, they stay wet. Uh, and it caused quite a few people some problems. However, because of the peat bog, and my boots were constantly wet, the ankle and the pin, especially that area, started to go septic and gammy. So when we got to Mount Kent, uh, having sort of tabbed across or yumped across, it was a good time ready to, to nip down to the RAP, uh, the Royal Marines Medical Post, to, to get it cleaned up and get it strapped up, ready for the attacks. And so when I went down there, the medical officer uh, demanded that I went back, collected all my equipment, my kit, and he was going to fly me out that night uh, to the Uganda you know, the hospital ship. And uh, and I just thought, not a chance in hell am I going to tab all this way <laughs> for you to then fly me off just before we start doing the attack. I totally ignored him. Went back, and a day later, we were sat on Mount Kent, and one of the guys in the, the OP party, who's sadly not here anymore, Hedo, he said, Mick, um, why is there a medical officer walking up the hill towards us? <laughs> so, so I grabbed the binos and, and it was this, uh, th I think of it, the equivalent to a captain, I think. Uh, and, and luckily the battery commander just happened to, to be with us. But the BC backed me up and the BC said, listen, you, you've got your answer. Hawks doesn't want to go. Um, let him let him crack on like, you know. So we did. We were fantastic. So we did two sisters, did the attack on that, which went perfectly. Um, we actually fired the first fire mission regiment in Angus in Korea during the, the build-up to the attacks when we adjusted the regiment onto Two Sisters. And we didn't realise at the time until the CO came on the, the radio and said, oh, by the way, this is a first fire mission regiment in Angus. The, the downside of the, the ankle, so we came back on the Canberra and because my ankle was now completely gammy and, and mushy and I spent the whole period of coming back on the Canberra in the sick bay on antibiotics <laughs> and drips and, and all that sort of stuff. But, hey, I wouldn't change it for the world, um, if that makes sense. You know, who the hell in their right minds goes sick in, in a conflict? Unless you've got your arms shot off or your legs shot off, then you just get on with it. So that, in a way, was an indicator that I was going to move elsewhere, if that makes sense. And, and that really was my 
my kick towards going to, to Hereford. And a lot of that you're describing there about who goes to conflict and takes that route out. I think that goes a lot to explain for civilians who might be listening. A lot of that is driven by you don't want to let your friends down. You don't want to let the battery down. It's nothing about queen and country. It's all about letting the guy left or right of you down, isn't it? Yeah, we, we're on a four-man team. Um, and if I'm not there, then there's only a three-man team. And and you're looking at major battles coming ahead. You know, we didn't know that they were going forward after the, the initial major battles. We were expecting to do two sisters, and we were then expected uh, to do Sapper Hill, which was a heavily, heavily fortified. So we, we were expecting a hard time. So to, to put the, the four-man team down to three was just unthinkable mm-hmm. and, and never even crossed my mind that, that we were I was going to do that, uh, if that makes sense. And you're right, it's that mentality. It was a good, it was a good little team, and, and bear in mind that the Falklands was the last major Old fashioned type conflict, it's like a world World War Two battle, essentially. Wasn't yeah, it? for me, it was a, a great experience, and and it gave me really the groundwork for where I wanted my career to go thereafter. I'd just like to ask you a couple of questions about bringing in fire in the Falklands, because for people that have not been on an artillery OP training to be what's called an observation post assistant or an FO. A lot of your training is done in places like Salisbury Plain, which is open rolling countryside. It's quite easy to observe the fall of shot in the training. But down in the Falklands, you had the rock runs, you had uh, the mountains. And when you're firing up a hill or down a hill, those corrections have become a lot more difficult. It's at night. That must have been a huge challenge to, to you guys, even though you're well trained. Coping with bringing down rounds in that environment must have been a huge, huge challenge. Yeah, I tell you what, it was a lot of it was the fudge factor, um, and uh, and when you were bringing bringing rounds in, uh, bear in mind that we used to do a lot of danger close, and if you do a proper danger close, as in the Lark Hill way of doing it, we wouldn't get anywhere. We threw that system out the window, uh, and we just made really bold corrections towards us, and basically just passed word of mouth out to the Marines. Listen, we're, we're bringing in some rounds now. Keep your head down. Make sure that they knew the the call a shot so that they knew it was our rounds that were coming in. Um, quite ironically, I uh, literally about two months after I got back from the Falklands, I was put on a advanced opiac course down in uh, uh, down in Lark Hill. And fantastic for the school down there because once they realised that we'd been in the Falklands and actually doing it for real, they decided to modify slightly uh, their danger close procedures for the terrain that we were in. Uh, if yeah. I and some, and, and, you know, what works on a flat environment, as you alluded to, Lark Hill, Salisbury Plain, was never going to work in the Falklands where, where it was very mountainous. I read a book recently uh, called, I think it was Yompers, it's about four or five commando in the Falklands, and we had a guy from 29 came to our troop called Ingy. Do you know Ingy? Ingy, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a good dit where the company commander of the, I can't remember which company it is, but they're going along, and hear this shout, and he turned around, and Engie's guddled a trout out of stream, like a six-pound trout out of stream. He's a farmer dressed in military uniform. Uh, <laughs> he's just a typical Yorkshire monty. He epitomised, really, that, that type of soldier that you need. Someone that gets down and dirty uh, and just gets on with it. There was no airs and graces over with Ingy at all. He's quite an inspirational lad. Brilliant, absolute brilliant, brilliant skier uh, and everything else, and a person that people looked up to. And, and I liked him purely because there was no airs and graces and and he'd look like a bag of shit, basically. Cause he, he wasn't a camp soldier, no, neither was I. So that resonated with me. Good lad, uh, really. Yeah. I really liked him. As a, and I think it was a sad day when uh, when he left 2-9. Um, and I think he went to Germany. He came to the stay behind role that we were doing in Germany yeah. Yeah. And, and joined us. And there was another 2-9 officer, Willie McCracken. He set up the selection course that we did for our stay behind role in uh, Germany and he got an MC in the Falklands, I think, didn't he? He did. He, uh, by far the best battery commander I've ever worked with because he was battery commander when I volunteered to go on selection and fantastic bloke. Uh, I, I even invited him to my wedding and, and I don't like Rupert's generally. Uh, so for me to invite Willie McCracken, uh, it was a sad loss when I heard that he had passed on, like, you know. And if any listener, Google Captain Willie McCracken MC and read his citation. He's a typical warrior. Uh, he was firing 66s. He was bringing in those danger close missions that we were talking about. 
when you when you think that citation was written by the parachute regiment, bear in mind that they're writing it about a commando. Uh, it says a lot, uh, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. You already sort of hinted at it already there, Mick. What made you go for Hereford then? Was you getting a real taste for what you wanted to go in the future and this is after the Falklands you thought, right, I need to go up to the next level? Yeah, absolutely. And I think after the Falklands, we uh, you get a bit disillusioned, really, um, because I enjoyed that, you know, and, and being shot at. Then it was something that got the, the old juices running and stuff like that. Uh, so when you go to Norway, Canada, exercise in Lark Hill year on, year out, the odd Denmark trip, um, it be- it became a bit predictable, so for me it was the deciding factor really. So, uh, so I, uh, so literally I wanted to go down in 19, the the winter of eighty six, which just happened to be the worst winter they've had around the area for a, a long time. So when we started Test Week, they uh, they cancelled it, and it's the first time ever that Test Week had been cancelled because of the weather. In the meantime, we did weapons and and all the stuff that you would have done. Uh, the week after test week. So we did that a week early. No improvement in the weather whatsoever. We then, you know, sod it, you need to go for it. And then uh, on one of the tabs, uh, I was first off the truck and I said, right, Hawksy, away you go. I I kid you not, the the snow was up to your, your, your crutch. That's how deep the snow was. And when you're first out, you're trailblazing. And I know what okay. you go like, you know. And all I, all I remember is getting to one of the checkpoints and the chief instructor was there uh, and he advised me to step off the trail and let, let the next guy come in. But when you keen as mustard and away you go, I, I ignored that advice. <laughs> the last thing I remember is getting up to the final checkpoint um, and then waking up in a helicopter. And I was like, what the hell? What, what am I doing here? And it wasn't until I got back to the med centre in Hereford when the uh, training major came in and said, listen, how, how are you feeling? Uh, and then you explained what had happened. And, and I'd got to the checkpoint, taken my Bergen off, grabbed the DS's Bergen, and ran in the exact opposite direction to what he was telling me to go. Um, and, and I was just out of it, completely out of it. Hypothermia? Or... Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the exhaustion and, and everything else. Yeah. So I, uh, because I had a gypsy's warning, I, I just thought, ah, gypsy's warning. <laughs> Just crack on, like, you know, for the next one. Uh, but the training major said, sorry, but the doctors advised that he can't go out again tomorrow. So that's you off selection. And to be honest, it's probably the biggest disappointment I've ever had in my life uh, was was being told that. And uh, so I went back to our broth and I, I met my future wife. And, uh, and it's funny because the people that were on that selection that passed, one of them sent a letter to us. Because uh, it was the old letter days in them days. Sent a letter saying, listen, I understand you're going with some bird, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but get rid of her and get your backside back on the next selection. Obviously, I ignored that advice and uh, I, I've got four fantastic kids, so no regrets there. I then went and did the All Arms Commander course as a, an instructor. Loved it. Uh, yeah, absolutely loved it down there. Sort of passing on experiences to the younger lads coming through. But from there, I, I then went and, and did selection and, and was lucky enough to pass. And I say lucky because there's some fantastic individuals that do selection that unfortunately, for some reason, majority of the time they get injured uh, and they, they just don't get through. It, it's just having that, that luck of getting to the start of chess week without an injury uh, initially. Because if you're carrying an injury through chess week, then you, you, you know, you, you're asking for trouble. Uh, but that initial running up and down the hills is is actually the easy part, uh, the easy part of selection uh, because the, the jungle, without a shadow of doubt, um, is the real test of it all. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I think most non-military people know about the fitness test to get into Hereford. A lot of people think that is the main selection part, but as you've just alluded to, and people I've talked to in the regiment, and I've got friends in the regiment. It's really used just to weed people out before progressing to continuation training, isn't it? And then once you get to the jungle, as you've already said, that is where the real selection takes place. So what is it that makes that jungle environment so unique, especially for selecting SF soldiers? Yeah, I think um, I think it's the closeness uh, of everything and... Uh... And you always think that as a trooper going through that you're you're under you're being watched. 
you know, all the DS are watching you all the time. So your weapons and your shoulder and um, and psychologically, it's 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 really really hard and it's very hilly. Uh, so it's physically demanding, mentally demanding, uh, morale wise difficult. Um, and um, I just remember one time when we we're on a quite a steep hill, took me Bergen off, and we all went round in a you know fire position. And I just heard this clunk, 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 clunk. Someone's burger had rolled down the hill. And <laughs> as you do, you start giggling to yourself, thinking, poor burger. And I turned around, and it was my burger. <laughs> it was my burger. <laughs> and I literally thought I'd failed selection because my burger had rolled down the hill. And so psychologically, you're walking down and then chabbing back up with this burger. And all you're thinking about is, I've failed. I'm on a helicopter. Like yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll tell you what's bizarre is my eldest son now, he was about a month and a half old when I went on selection. So when I was in the jungle, this uh, this guy, and he was from the Royal Signals, but he came up to me and wanted to talk to me about having my child and all this. And I just fobbed him away because I couldn't afford to start thinking about home when you're in the mm-hmm. jungle environment. You, you've got to be completely engrossed in, in what you need to do and not worry about what's happening back there. That's what your wife, she deals with that. And uh, so I fobbed him off and, and then next day he, he canned it. He decided that enough was enough. So when he, he, he sacked it, it had this domino effect because on some selections, nobody comes off the jungle phase if they all get to the end. Or one person goes and it has like a domino effect and uh, and then all of a sudden... Loads and loads of people started coming off, like which was quite bizarre. Uh, but it, it's just mentally draining, physically draining, pressure, uh, and everything else. You just can't imagine. And also, bear in mind, it can be flipping dangerous as well. We we had a fatal, unfortunately, on our selection when uh, a, a guy who was volunteering uh, to be the enemy uh, was accidentally shot dead, unfortunately. So that was a, a bit of an eye-opener uh, as to the way the regiment operate. Obviously, it's all new drills to us. You know, we're just normal Green Army. Uh, so having that pressure of learning and making sure you don't make mistakes, uh, especially on the, the ranges, uh, because they're, they're very narrow arcs. We, we're used to being in the Green Army of having quite large arcs to, uh, to fire live rounds down. So any slight mistake can actually get someone else killed. So... Yeah. That pressure as well, you wet and damp all, <laughs> all the time. Uh, and I tell you what helped me, because your admin has got to be absolutely 100%, is all the Norway's that we did. And I know it's a chalk and cheese, different different environment. Uh, but in Norway, yeah, your admin has got to be spot on. In the jungle, uh, likewise, different weather conditions. But your, your admin has to be absolutely spot on dude, to survive it. And again... Um, lucky enough to get through that, I got told that uh, I'd pass that. So that was fine. But quite ironically, the the next phase after that, which is combat survival, we had four failures, and and that's really unusual because normally that's the last phase, because, isn't it? Yeah, because em- everybody knows all about combat survival, uh, and in a way, you just tick it off in the back of your head. And the the failures were psychological. So one of the parachute regiment guy got captured when we went on the run. No big deals, you know, loads of people get captured and all they do is they give you a bit of a hard time and then you go back in the bag and, and carry on. Uh, and he psychologically wrote himself off. He, he just thought that because he'd been captured, he was automatically failed. So that was the first one. Uh, the next one was a guy who hyperventilated in his mask. He was gone. Another one didn't like the stress positions. Gone. And then the final one, which was quite bizarre, um, was the one that, that didn't stick with the, the big five, you know, or the big four, your name, rank, number, and date of birth, or whatever it is that you, you're supposed to say. Um, and he decided to tell him his life story. <laughs> but, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, it's funny, because me and the lad, when we came out, we started talking, and he's, he's uh, an ex-green jacket, a good lad. Uh, but he, uh, he he said, oh, how, how did you get on then, Vic? I said, to be honest, I think I might have failed here. He said, why? What, what, you know, what happened? I went, well, when I was in a stress position, someone came up and put a little bit of bread in my hand. I said, quickly, eat that. And I whooped it down my throat, as you do. And I made the mistake of saying, cheers, mate. So uh, psychologically, I, th- I thought, fucking hell, I failed. Uh, yeah. They're bound to fail me for that, like, you know. Anyway, that, apparently that wasn't an issue. 
And the green jacket lad said, yeah, Mick, I think I failed because I, I actually nodded to one of the questions and they can construe that, the video in you. Did you murder these people? Yes. I did. So we were looking at each other thinking, oh, well, we both failed off to do this again. And then this guy, <laughs> this guy came up and uh, said, oh, is that, is that what you said? Is that what you did? And we were like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, and he then told us what he was doing and made this lad just look at each other and thought, yeah, I think we're going to be okay. <laughs> and he obviously failed. Well, I did combat survival. And for listeners who might not know it, the what used to be the Army Combat Survival Instructors course, the guys from Hereford do it and other guys from the Army come in and do the course at Hereford as well. And I think the main difference is, I think at the end is, the Hereford guys do a 36-hour interrogation and I did a 24 and our interrogation, which was enough. I didn't want to do the 36. I was quite happy doing 24. But one of the lessons they teach you is, is be the grey man. You remember that, Mick. And uh, so day one of the course, we're in the auditorium at Stirling Lines, it was then. And uh, the OC training wing comes in. He gives the brief. And then he says, have we got a Sergeant Ferguson in the audience? My blood ran cold. And I'm looking around going, he can't be talking about me. And he goes, said it again. Sergeant Ferguson, stand up. And I stood up. And I had a friend at Hereford at the time, and he told me that X says to, were to give you a special welcome from the training team. <laughs> so, when, you know, at the end of the bit, you do the survival area, and then you got herded in and processed, get a finger up the bum and stripped and all that. I got some extra special attention at that point. I'm sure the, the MO kept his uh, wristwatch on and used more than a finger. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> For some bizarre reason, they, they actually thought I had diarrhoea um, before we went into the interrogation phase of it. So, uh, and I don't know where they got that from, because every time I went in for interrogation, there was a pint of water on the desk. And they uh, they would just say, quickly drink that now. And I, I would neck it down, because I thought I was just normal. Yeah. Um, and then when the chief instructor saw, I said, you know, do you recognize me? That's it, finished now, blah, blah, blah. How's your diarrhoea? And I went, I never had diarrhoea. <laughs> Some some poor bugger <laughs> had gone through some dark, no no fluid suffering. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting yeah. to talk about psychological pressure because I had a good friend of mine went and did the course and he got into the jungle and he was saying that you'd stand to... He said it was strange because your DS would come around just put a hand in your sh shoulder and that was just making sure that you'd changed into your wet kit. They'd say, get your compass out and make sure you had your compass bearing set to the ERV. And he said he made a couple of little mistakes on the ranges and he was in a patrol with paras and he didn't think he was gelling with them. And again, in the jungle, you're lying in your hammock for quite a long time at night, aren't you? Because there's not a lot of movement in the jungle at night. And he said little mistakes he made in the ranges chewed him up and chewed him up. And then in the end, they got to him and he voluntarily withdrew from the course. And he got taken back and he got his debrief and uh, the OC said to him, you're on course to pass. But that is part of the selection, isn't it? That psychological piece. Yeah, so on the final exercise in the jungle for me, the training major came past and he was asking uh, some pretty pretty awkward questions for people within the patrol. And then when he came up to me, he went, Oxy. And I went, yeah. He said, you're just about ugly enough to be in this unit. And that was it. And he, he bogged off. And so when we went back, as you go back and get, get a brew on or whatever, right, what, what did he say? What did he say? He went, oh, he just said that I'm, I'm ugly enough. <laughs> oh, flipping hell, that's you, Parson. Uh, <laughs> but bizarre, you know what I mean? It, it's the little, little indicators that, that tell you. It, it, uh, it's a strange, and it's an honest procedure that, that because when you think that if you're struggling uh, or any of the DS have got doubts about you, they'll flick you over to another DS uh, so that the other DS can actually have a look at you. And sometimes that gets overturned because the other DS will say, actually, uh, he's not a bad bloke, to be honest, uh, because you can have that personality clash. Yeah. Uh, if, that, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, it's, it's actually quite an honest and robust, which is probably why they've, they've never changed it for many years, and quite rightly so. You, you pass selection, and you're posted to B Squadron Mountain Troop. A couple of questions. Did you get a choice of what troop and what speciality you did? And what was it like when you arrived in the squadron, and what was the mountaineering training like? You get an option, obviously, your troop and your squadron. You normally get the troop that you want because that's a, that's an entry skill. So, obviously, mobility, uh, boat troop, mountain troop, or air troop. And uh, and I, I wanted to do mountain troop. 
Um, but as did another person. So we there's four of us going to a B squadron. Uh, one went to air troop, one went to boat troop. Nobody wanted to go to mobility, and two of us wanted to go to mountain troop. And th- and this guy was an XRF, big climber, a professional climber. And uh, so when I went in there, I, I was lucky enough to be the first one to go in and see the uh, squadron sergeant major, fantastic bloke. Yeah, he said to me, what troop do you want to go to? And I went, mountain. He went, you're an idiot. Uh, <laughs> he said, yep, yeah, you've got it. <laughs> So I walked out thinking, guess what? You're going to end up having to go to to mobility. But thankfully, he he got what he wanted as well. So yeah, not many people volunteer for for manning troops. So off we went to manning troop, and it was great because uh, it was a good mixture of all sorts. And and we were quite heavily loaded with their uh, ex commando. So a lot a lot of five nine, few two nine, a uh, couple of marines. Uh, Do they send them in clumps? Because uh, I've heard, and you can correct me here, the A Squadron's parachute regiment, G's. Guards, is that true? Did they clump the two, the commandos together? No, uh, no, not not really. A, 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 I would say A and B are pretty much similar, mishmash of all sorts. D used to be the very heavily parachute regiment, and then G obviously guards. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, A, I would say A and B were pretty much similar, uh, with being more of a uh, a mishmash of all sorts, uh, if that makes sense. So, and I know where you went. I think we had one parachute regiment guy at the time, uh, and then we had Billy Billingham turned up with another lad, so a th- two and a three para guy. Uh, and, and we never had an officer. You know, we didn't have an officer for about seven years, which was great, but um, no one passed, so they couldn't fill the slot. So they troop staffy. Uh, at the time, they ran the troop line on it, and it was great. You get thrown in the deep end. My very first trip that we did was to New Zealand. Off you go to climb Mount Cook, regardless of what skill you had in climbing, away you went, because it's, it's a regiment mentality. You're in Mount Troop, there's a mountain, go and climb it. Climb it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, which is great. And I, and I think I must have done about five years before they decided to put me on the climbing carter, uh, learning the uh, pro- proper technique, because I've always been a bit of a fudge. Yeah. Do the old granny knot rather than the old fancy knots and stuff like that, and you get away with it. We're up, not on the mountainside, though, surely. Yeah. Well, I think it was funny. I, we were doing ice climbing, and and I was climbing with a good friend of mine, and the the guy on the course, the the instructor, and so so I was climbing and it went up, it came back down. I didn't realise at the time, but all the safety kit was with Gary because I'd climbed and he'd collected it. So this guy says to me, "Right, mate, you know I want you to lead up this one." So off I went. Uh, thankfully, I had good crampons and uh, good axes. Um, and, and I got about 20 feet up. And he said, oh, Mick, um, do you want to start thinking about putting your first bit of protection in? And I looked down and, and Gary <laughs> Gary was stood behind him w- <laughs> waving the, the belt with all the protection. And I realised I didn't have any protection at all. And I went, yeah, just a bit further. And I and literally, I just carried on, <laughs> as you do. <laughs> And it must have been about sixty foot climb. Got over over the the top. Said yeah 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 on to the club. And and I was actually beelaying him uh, round the ice axe <laughs> uh, to bring him up. Like and he, he comes to the top and he went, what the hell? <laughs> Do you end up climbing with weapons and bergens and everything in the end? You know, start off clean fatigue and then build up. But you end up doing the hauling bergens up the the yeah. money. Yeah, absolutely. I, I must admit, it's not on the par with... Uh, so the Royal Marines are up there, Arctic Warfare. So we actually thought um, that at the time that we should actually send people down there to do their to do their course because they're, they're, they're more into it, whereas the climbing side of it for us is secondary, soldier first, uh, climbing second. So uh, to, to counter that, they then decided to send people away on German guides courses or... Norwegian courses and stuff like that. And and the good thing about the regiment is they pay good money for experts to teach the guys. And so the guys that do free falling, they don't jump with the RAF because you're wasting your time. You know, the, the RAF for some reason, or the weather's bad, so we can't jump. So that they'll spend the money and they'll send everyone over to the States and marry up with Delta Force or the SEALs to to do the jumps over there and the the guys are taught by the best uh, and and that's the same as the climbing they'll they'll bring in expert climbers to to teach all the boys how to climb get on the skills up yeah absolutely and and I think it's a testament really to understanding that you're not the best. Uh, you're not the best right away. So let's bring the best to bring you up to speed line, and that's good. I did a, a med course with a regiment at the very end of it. You do a an ATLS, advanced trauma life support weekend. 
And I tell you what, it's humbling because they bring in a guy called uh, Professor Keith Porter, uh, who is the leading guy in his field. And he came down from Birmingham. Um, and you've got all these faculty members, very, very clever individuals. And what they do is they bring all this medical knowledge and they bring it down to our level to make it really simple, if if that makes sense. At the end of it, it's quite humbling. And I, and I gave a speech um, as a thank you to the faculty. And it's funny because they brought all these medical guys on there to do the, the final exercise. And because we'd had six weeks in a classroom doing what we did, all the regiment guys passed it pretty much first time. And it was all the, the simulation stuff that, that they do it. And if you do it well on a simulation, they'll make sure that they make it harder. So it, it's it's actually a fantastic course, but, but really humbling, um, you know, that these clever, clever individuals can come down to Hereford in such a way that we understood it, because ultimately our aim is to keep somebody alive for seven days beyond the line. Um, but it, it's quite funny, because when you leave, qualification zero. Yeah. Not, not recognised, same as the, the SAS bodyguard uh, course. But really enjoyed it. Um, really enjoyed the climbing. But in the end, I, I volunteered to go off and do the 14 inch because for every year, the, the debt run their two courses a year. And what the regiment do is they put four people on every course. And it's a fantastic skill to, skill to have. Um, but what you have to do is you have to forget the regiment. You're now working with the, the geeks, uh, as we call them, the damn people. It's, it's their baby. It's their toy. So why your neck in? for the six-month course, once you get to the debt. For people that might not know, this is all surveillance, isn't it? It is. It's covert surveillance. And another time, it was because Northern Ireland was the hot potato. It was quite intense. And the, the reason it was intense, people were doing surveillance in London and places like that. In Northern Ireland, you're doing surveillance in hostile environments, uh, so in Catholic estates or Protestant estates. We did a lot of work against the Protestants and the Shankill. So third party awareness is the be all and end all. You can get blown in a minute. And what I mean by blown in, not blown up, blown up, but, but somebody can recognise you as being uh, a surveillance operator and that's you off the ground. You, you've got to change your appearance and if you're in a car at the time, you change your car. So it's a it's quite a big thing, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. We had a, a, a fantastic 18 months where we had Lots of successes, but on both sides, Catholic and Protestant, because believe you me, there are bad people on either side, you know, uh, if that makes sense. But on that vein, I literally got back to the regiment, and, and this is why they are, I feel, are the, the best special forces unit, bar none, is the diversity. So one minute you're doing Northern Ireland, long hair, Go and tell Jesus to get his hair cut or, or Colonel Custer, tell <laughs> Custer to get his hair cut. And then next minute you're in, in Bosnia or you come back and then you're on the anti-terrorist team. Uh, so the diversity of, of the work that an individual has to do uh, is, is actually quite staggering. And, and you can fit in doing all these different roles. And I think having done the bit in Northern Ireland helped me when we actually went uh, to Bosnia. Um, well, we had a bit of an incident uh, out there. Well, before we go into that, I'd just like to do a couple of pointers for listeners. We've done a few episodes in Northern Ireland. One, what it was like to be on the Green Army tour, the normal conventional army in the late 80s in Londonderry. And then a friend of mine came on and we did an episode on the RUC where we talked about he went from the army to the RUC as a uniformed RUC officer. And then he passed selection into E4 Alpha, which is the sort of the RUC equivalent of uh, the debt at the time. And the episode after this podcast, we've got an interview with Henry Hemming, who's an author, who's wrote Four Shots in the Night. And it's about the agent handling in Northern Ireland. So we've got a good few episodes there if people want to just get a background and good information on Northern Ireland. But as... Mix already alluded to, we're going to now move on to Bosnia, where you managed to put your conduct after capture training into good effect, Mick, for what I gather. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Bosnia was a bit, bit of a funny old conflict, to be honest, because we we went over there on the disguise of being Joint Commission uh, observers, JCOs. Um, most people knew that JCOs were SES, uh, and certainly they... Uh, General Didakovic of Five Corps up in Bihać, which is where we were. He certainly knew, knew who we were. Uh, so 
We didn't wear any UN equipment, um, never used to wear body armour, because when you're dealing with the, the forward factions of units, none of them have got body armour, so you lose street credibility. That, uh, that matchiness they've got. Yeah. So when a blue helmet and a blue blah, 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 it just, yeah, so we, we didn't do that. So we, we just went about our business, uh, as the SES do, uh, getting, getting intelligence, sending it back, completely ignoring the, the UN, <laughs> the UN sort of way of working, because the UN weren't really effective for a reason, uh, and we certainly didn't want to get bogged down doing what they were doing. So we, we tended to do our own thing. So there was a time, a good friend of mine, uh, who everybody will know, called Billy Billingham. Um, we were in the same patrol. There's, we were in a four-man patrol, and we were tasked with setting up a, a meeting between two generals, um, Dudarkovic from Five Corps for the Muslims, and uh, a Bosnian Serb general. And it was located just north of Sanski Mosque, uh, for people that know Bosnia. And it was on the main road from Sanski Mosque to Priador, so literally about 10 miles north of Sanski Mosque. So the day before we did the, one of them did the recce uh, as to where the location was going to be. Happy about it. And me and Billy actually went down and spoke to the Serb frontline troops. They were manning their, their checkpoint, went down, had a chat with them. I said, listen, tomorrow we'll, we'll come down. We'll have a, another, you know, we'll have a, a little coffee with you. You know, the old Serb coffee. And, yeah. um, so we'd set the meeting. No Slivovic. Sorry. No Slivovic. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is, that a, is that a little white lie there, Mick? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's funny. So we, we'd set the meeting up, um, and and it was the UN were there in numbers, and I'm thinking that the self-importance really. So we'd just let them get on with it, and uh, and we just happened to have Danish uh, UN, so we let them get on with it. Two lads stayed behind, keep an eye on it, and we walked past uh, the light infantry. I had a warrior vehicle parked as a manning a, a checkpoint between the meeting and the Serb side. So we, we just tapped on it and said, listen, lads, we'll, we'll just offer a quick chat. Um, you know, lay in between, what the hell are these two doing? And as we walked down there, we noticed that the Serbs had looked, they looked slightly different <laughs> than what they did the, the day before. And when we got there, bear in mind, we're all, we're just carrying small arms, pistols. And when we got down there, they, uh, they obviously got a bit spooked seeing these two strange people in completely non- NATO or UN uniform, and, and it spooked them, and, and they pulled their weapons on us straight away, and, and actually took us prisoner, took us to a local house where they took took our pistols off us, um, took our maps off us, and thankfully our maps were completely clear, we had no books, completely clear, so we had nothing on us at all that would say that we were SES or whatever. They then decided that they, they were going to drive us. So me and Billy got in the back of a, a little 4x4 vehicle and they drove us to Priador, to one of the sites where, quite horrific actually, but that it's where they used to interrogate and starve a lot of the, the Muslim people and it was on TV and stuff like that. So that's that's where we were heading for. Me and Billy were in the back of where we were just, you know, whispering to each other. Um, and the, the guy in the front passenger seat Span round. He was a big lad. Span round and and cocked his AK directly in front of our faces. I don't know if it was nerves or whatever, but me and Billy looked at each other and just started laughing, which really annoyed. <laughs> and surprisingly, and and the reason we were laughing is, you know, we're on the front line here. Why have you not got around in your chamber? Because that's automatically, you just assume everyone's got around in the chamber. We then, you know, made a big show of cocking his weapon. Anyway, so we then ended up um, getting taken into a building in this place here. And now Billy had tried to speak Serbo Croat because he'd been on a six week Serbo Croat course. Um, and I hadn't because I was in Northern Ireland. I missed all the build up. So Billy, Billy was trying to speak a wee bit of them um, or a little bit of uh, Serbo Croat. Uh, but I got dragged in first for interrogation, and, um, and I just gave the perfect cover story. Listen, I'm a driver. I've only been here two weeks. I know nothing. Um, so they threw me out as Mr. Thickey. Get, get Mr. Thickey out here and get that other one in here. So Billy then got dragged in, um, and, uh, and he, he must have been in there for about an hour or so. I was in 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm thrown out. <laughs> um Billy came out, so in the meantime, I'm outside, and, and this guy that we laughed at, him and his muckers decided to tickle my ribs with his bayonet and a bit of kicking, a bit of intimidation. But 
nothing untoward, if that makes sense. And um, so Billy came out, um, sat in the corridor, and he was about he was about ten feet away from me. And then the door burst open, and then Billy got dragged back in again for for another session. Out he came, in he went. Out he came, in he went. So this went on about four or five times, and uh, and I and I just thought, what's going on here, like you know. So anyway, in uh, when he came out this time, we got actually put together or fairly close together. And, uh, and Billy sort of managed to whisper to me, flapping hell, mate, what did you tell him? I said, sorry, mate, I just told him I'm a driver. And Billy looked at me and went, yeah, but I'm a driver. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, a typical humour, snooze you lose, mate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in the, so in the meantime, uh, the two lads that were back, they, they obviously got word from the light infantry that, that we'd been taken. So they rang Sarajevo up and the general, quite rightly so, said, listen, Go in now and arrest the Serb General and, and tell him that if he doesn't um, get Billy and Mick released, then he's going to end up with five corps in, in BH. Uh, and believe you me, he pooped his pants at the thought of that. So they gave him a sat phone, he made the call, got all the way back to Predor. Uh, we, we were then released after uh, about, uh, probably about four hours, four or five hours we were sort of kept for. Uh, driven back to where we originally got taken, we were then handed our pistols and our maps and everything else. Um, at least like, we walked back to, to where the other lads were like. And for us, it wasn't a drama. And quite ironically, when Billy started doing Who Dares Wins, he actually alluded to the fact that he'd, he'd been captured. And a lot of the B Squad lads that were out in Bosnia with us at the time all rang him up and said... What's all that about, Billy? You're waffling. You've never been captured. And he went, actually, <laughs> we did. You make him in Bosnia. But because we didn't make a song and dance about it and make it a big drama, the only people that knew that we'd been captured are the two other lads in the patrol, the uh, the general, and obviously the squadron commander. Um, and I think one other person. Yeah. Were you worried you'd have to get the beers then if the lads found out? <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. But it, but it was, it was funny because I'd literally about three days before I'd got a, been given a citation of an award that I'd got the you know, QCB over in Northern Ireland. So I thought, you know, the hardly likely to be give me that one minute, and then give me a hard time for you know getting captured <laughs> over there, like you know. So for us, it, it was just one of them things. It, it happens, but just just get on with it. Just don't make a song and dance about it. It's strange, isn't it? Because we often train in resistance interrogation the way we would treat people. But a lot of our enemies don't do that. And, you know, you alluded to what those, the Bosnian that took you prisoner, if they had decided to take the gloves off, it wouldn't have just been asking you questions and stress positions. You'd have been in for a pretty hard time, wouldn't you? Yeah, no, absolutely. The thing that I had in the back of my mind was um, they're hardly likely to shoot people who they don't really know much about. Uh, they, they had an inkling that we were part of the UN, um, they, they're hardly likely to, to kill, you know, someone from the UN because the repercussions for that would, would be massive. Like, so, so that was always in the back of your mind. It always keeps them a positive in the back of your mind rather than just the negatives all the time. And, and that, and I think that's quite important so that when you're going through the Maya, is always maintain that, that bit of positivity. And, and as it happened, the, the phone call to the general was the thing that got us released. And it, it's funny because I, I was talking to the guy who was the, the other person in that patrol literally about a week ago because we were talking about the story. Uh, he told me his side of it when they found out and about their decision that they were going to instantly call the general uh, because obviously calling the general had the desired effect. The backup from the general to say arrest the Serbian general. I mean, to be honest, the, the Danish UN were up in arms because it would have caused a major incident, a major diplomatic incident, but they, again, they kept it fairly low kick, but good on the general uh, from our side, back at the boys up like, you know. Well, you saw that in Iraq, didn't you, when the two Hereford lads got taken to Iraq and they ended up crashing warriors through the police compound and going in with full-on armour to go rescue these guys. So I think for an SAS operator, it must be good to know, as you've already alluded to, that you've got that backup and they'll do their best to get you out if they can. I'd tell you what, because you alluded it to, that was really down to the blokes on the ground, as opposed to the, the backup that I got, a general. The the one you alluded to there was actually the blokes on the ground made the decision that, listen, forget that, we're going to get our blokes out. And, and I think 
having that mentality of people around you. That's why I think when people join the SES, they uh, they actually know that they're actually surrounded by top like quality minded. operators. Yeah. Um, and no disrespect to the Green Army at all, but some people in the Green Army there, in your little unit that you're in, and, and we had it in 2-9, there's some people that you probably would have second thoughts about going back to war with them, because I certainly had that feeling after the Falklands, uh, if, if that makes sense. And don't get me wrong, 2-9 were fantastic people, loved them a bit, very professional. But you always get that in the back of your mind, wouldn't I like to go back to war with an individual? And if the answer mm-hmm. is no, then you shouldn't put them in that position. You should say, right, as I did, uh, go off and do selection and, and go to war with people that you had 100% confidence with. Is there an element to self-selection at Hereford? So you get through the selection process and you get into your squadron. Do you get many people just do a three-year tour? In any unit, you get people who look round, and the SS would be no different, but people look round and go, do you know what? Personally, I don't think I'm up to this. Uh, right. Uh, funny enough, uh, two two X 29 guys that were in B squadron, both did about, about four or five years, and then both of them both decided to get out where for me um you know four or five years you, you're just actually starting the, because your first four years in the regiment really you you got no major responsibilities you, you're collecting the tea and for the rangers and stuff like that for your first two years and there's no major responsibility because you've lost all your rank as well and you're sort of moving yourself back up there uh, so you, you're not really a player within the regiment until about the four-year point, it's funny because when I first joined the regiment, we had a spare day doing the anti, anti, anti-terrorist anti team. Uh, and they said, oh, mate, artillery, could we go and spend the day uh, at Lark Hill working on the, the Imbatron and trying to book the Imbatron? Which is, uh, for people who might not know, that's the simulator, isn't it? The artillery yeah. simulator. Yeah. Trying to book that, that's normally booked up two years in advance. So there's me, Mick Hawks, pretending now to be a staff sergeant, uh, even though I'm just a trooper, <laughs> pretending to be a staff sergeant, uh, ringing um, Lark Hill up, saying, listen, can we, SES, trying to play the SES card, can we come down? And they cleared the day for us. Went down there, all drove down there in five Range Rovers, <laughs> uh, turned up at the Imbatron, and they, they gave a little spiel, um, and they, the officer that was running it, said, do you want me to leave a guy behind so that he can... And, and I said, to be honest, all I need is the operator and I'll do the teaching myself because our teaching on RT, uh, I target was slightly different to, mm. to the way they do it. Ours, ours was, you know, uh, uh, an eight-figure grid, big, bold correction, and then your first round fire for effect. It wasn't the, no adjusting at all. adjustments. Yeah, uh, and, and you went straight around. And the, and the guys loved it because they were seeing it. Um, on the yeah. intron, because it is quite realistic, uh, about, rather than just map and compass and and this and the other. And they and the good thing was is they got the theory about the the major adjustments being really accurate. Make sure that first eight figure grid you give and the direction is is spot on. Spot on. You'll be you'll be there. You know you'll be in the ballpark. Uh, and then just a major left and right and a major adjustment and flipping go for it because that that's that's what you would do in wartime. The regiment guys haven't got time to be faffing about doing adjustments. <laughs> a lot of the time, you don't have to be worried about friendly troops being in the location either, just for the way you operate. So if the rounds are being bold adjusted, doesn't matter so much, does it? Afghanistan and Iraq could be considered a golden era for special forces operations. One of the things that you could argue is that SF units were overused and in many cases misused. By that, I mean, you know, you could maybe have argued that some of the operations they're doing, well-trained light infantry could have done them. But that took a heavy toll on a lot of the operators. And I was talking to a Delta operator called Tom Satley about this on Podcast 40. And he was describing that constant into battle all the time, full tempo operations. Because a lot of special force operations are designed to be quick in and out, aren't they? Not continuously on task. I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. Unfortunately, that's part of the job. When units go over there, they're basically sat in the camp not doing a lot and pushing weights and then one of the squadrons rolls up and takes over from them and are out every night it's good not only is it good morale for the regiment because uh, uh, to be honest regiment guys like being on the ground though that, that's 
because that's what they're joined for. But what you've got to realise is while they're doing that, uh, they're actually saving the lives of some of the infantry soldiers and the Green Army from having to go and do that themselves, if that makes sense. And so there was never, ever any sort of complaints that it was full on and this. And, and I, I understand that as an outsider, you, you know, people probably think there was too much. But there's also that, um, like, one squadron would take over another squadron and that they had a great sort of successful six month. So we need to beat that. Uh, so they would then go out, and it was like a creeping excellence with each squadron trying to match what they, the last squadron did uh, and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not saying that um, it, it took its toll. It, it does, but when you volunteer to, to join the SES, and you, you expect the, uh, the workload to be there. Like, and, and if mm. that workload is such that it's saving the lives of Green Army who don't have the same comfort of the equipment and the intelligence that the tier one sf units have got uh then that's a good thing because i would hate to think that an ses unit would pull off and say listen green army you do a bit of work and two or three people were killed um for for doing that it's not the the regiment way uh absolutely they were overused but uh, they were overused for a reason the reason was a good reason looking at what's happening in the world now and I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what do you think the future holds for UKSF? And do you think the impact of a much smaller army, we're talking coming down to 72,000, and Hereford has not changed in size. And even when we had an army of 150,000, it's never been fully manned. Do you think that will have an impact on being able to sustain the regiment going forward? Yeah, it, it's a difficult question to, to answer that one. And uh, uh, a few years ago, SES ran a, a selection process. Nobody, not a single person, got in. So Derek's the Special Forces got dragged in and said, listen, we, we, we can't afford this uh, because we need people to pass. So they, the idea was that they weren't going to lower the standard, and quite rightly so. And, they, and what they did was they, they actually asked the SES squadrons, what do you think should be done about it? And the consensus were, in the first three weeks that you're on up and down the hills, your first two weekends is an ideal opportunity to give people uh, a better rest, get their bodies back working again, because that first three weeks, when it's full on, there's no hiding. Uh, and once you get an injury, that's you finished. And, mm -hmm. and as I alluded to at the very start, some fantastic operators don't pass because of injury. So the way around that was to, to give them their, their first two weeks off, uh, weekends off, uh, so that they could recover. Because you're not lowering the standard. You've still got to go over the same hills at the same speed and, and everything else. But hopefully uh, you've given people enough time to, to recover uh, and and get there because ultimately you're just trying to get that end product, uh, you know, that, that individual that suits being in the regiment. So, so it was a good move. Not lowering the standard, just changing it slightly, modifying it, and I'm being a bit yeah. more intelligent about how you're getting people on it. Yeah, absolutely, and and it worked well. And 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 even the older bolt said, "Well, actually, they're still doing the same thing because what I did on my selection, um, people are doing it now, and people fifty years my senior did it. So there's, there's never when I was in it was blah blah yeah. blah blah. There's none of that uh, because everybody knows that they, you've been through the same selection process." But I, I can see uh, a slight problem, and the reason being is because we're, we're no longer at war uh, and it's more of a, a bit of a peacetime activity at the moment. Um, so the parachute regiment are struggling with numbers, um, people coming in, and Royal Marines are obviously struggling with numbers. And, and with the MOD messing everything up at the moment with their retention and uh, recruitment policy, which is a, an absolute farce, um, it will have ultimately it will have a knock on effect with with special forces unfortunately because there's only so many people and I think when you you start seeing that that you know rather than 200 people turn up uh, to do selection and that sort of filters down to only 80 people now are going to turn up and even lower than that at some stage there's going to have to be a bit of a bit of a rethink and a bit of a revamp like they did a few years ago. Uh, quite funny, I went to a reunion in 2017, I've got a picture, uh, 2017, and the Sergeant Major of Beast one at the time, and bear in mind that he stood in front of all the old and bold, some pretty hefty sort of players, 
uh, the you know the legends of their own lifetime, I suppose. And and he stood up and said, "Listen, just so for the record, guys are better trained now than ever before." And and he was quite right because they were continually going on operations, Syria, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. They were constantly on operations, so their training to get in had to be a lot more than what it was when we went through. If that makes sense. And we all looked at each other and went, that, that's quite a ballsy statement, given the fact that who you're talking to. Yeah. Uh, but it was absolutely spot on. It was right. I think as as warfare changes, uh, you know, the, the, the mindset and everything else will change with it. And you, you just got to evolve with whatever's coming. So I think, yeah, it will have an impact because of the numbers, because um, SES can't be right up here numbers wise and the the rest of the army sort of down here. Yeah. There's gotta be a, a bit of give and take, uh, if that makes sense. But you know, MOD need to look in the mirror and say, what have we done wrong? Because everything that has gone wrong with the British Army and the British military in general is all down to one organization and that's the MOD. Procurement, retention, outsourcing contract, everything that's gone wrong is down to one organization. And when you get sixty thousand 470 members of the MOD and there's only a hundred and some thousand yeah. military. That tells you something, that's something wrong there. Yeah, there's something wrong. It'll be interesting to see if the army ends up but as you say, Hereford won't dilute its selection criteria. You've already touched on this. You mentioned Billy Billingham, mate. And a bit of a loaded question for you here. Do you think that the sort of the celebrity status and high profile image of the regiment is that a good or a bad thing? Uh, twofold. Uh, sometimes it's a good thing. Um, the reason I say that, so the, a good friend of mine got uh, kicked out of the regiment. He had a bit of a run in, uh, so he ended up going back to supposedly the parachute regiment, but he didn't. He left the army. He then got a job over in South Africa, and while he was on the flight, there was a guy was causing aggro on the flight and he walked up uh dropped him <laughs> chinned him they they then dragged him into first class and they restrained him the plane landed british airways plane landed and there was a bit of a fanfare you know people was, yeah thank you very much but the regiment didn't pick up on it and that and that was a, a moment lost that, that was something that the regiment lost really so because he left on dodgy terms uh, the regiment didn't want anything to do with that, but actually that's good publicity, if that makes sense, and it, and it was a lot. Yeah. So some things are uh, are good, some things are bad, um, and it, it's funny because the, the shaky boots, the S- SBS, they alluded to the fact the other day on LinkedIn, one person came on there and said, yeah, isn't it nice that the SBS don't have all these type celebrities? And I said, yeah, until Ant Middleton came along. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he sort of, uh, he was quite right. You're you're always going to get one person. Now, chatting with Billy uh, the other day, uh, he said, "Mate, because of what you're trying to do now, sometimes you need to you need to play the SES card to to help you out in in uh, life thereafter, uh, if that makes sense." And, and and nothing that I say cannot be on the World Wide Web. So that's why people really don't hide the fact of who they are. You know, I I left. 24 years ago, what what we did then was totally different. And you got Andy McNabb, Heine's flipping, you know, his name and all that sort of stuff. And we were in the same sport, like, you know, the, uh, personally, I don't think there's any need for that. It, it was a job at the end of the day, uh, you know, okay, slightly different, but it's a job and uh, you, you just get on with it. So I think it has its pros, pros and cons. Uh, yeah. It depends who... It depends who, who's actually the one in front of the camera. He can have a massive effect, but he can also have a downside of it as well. It's like any job, is that you have good ambassadors and bad ambassadors, and it just depends how they sell themselves. I think. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we we got guys uh, who are persona non grata from the SES camp. Fantastic blokes, uh, but they've done some, and they're not allowed back, which I find quite bizarre. I've heard the. Part of selection now, everybody fails, is about week seven, where it's the, the memoir writing part. Sorry, they... <laughs> the memoir writing part. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 you know, that light bulb moment about writing a book. But the, it's funny because the, the girl, the lady that's written, that co written the book, uh, a girl called Nicole, she's an Australian, she's a feminist, she's left winger, she used to work for Gordon Brown. Um, it, she's 
the person that you would never think. Now, I didn't know this when I contacted her. So when we did the meeting, the meeting was all about her telling me I'm the wrong person to write this book. But I, I sat down with her and I explained how I wanted the book to go. And it, it, yes, it's a life story. It's not a Bravo Two Zero. It's all about the pitfalls, not getting picked for Lincoln, sticking your ankle, all them little things, and and how you how you circumnavigating and get on with life, if that makes sense. And she absolutely loved it. And I thought if I can convince her with her sort of background, uh, then hopefully we can get this. But unfortunately, Nicole at the moment is really really badly ill and, and we nearly lost her uh, uh, over the Christmas period and I said listen put the book on hold because what I don't want to do she's done all the work um, and what I don't want to do is say listen let's hand it over to someone else because I want to get it out there quick she's done all the work so when she's ripe and she's proper and she's up and running she can then rerun with it uh, if that makes sense because uh, out of pure loyalty, you know, she's done all that work. You know, we spent uh, a year um, doing things like this, talking and, and going through things. When you get the book back on track, you need to get us a preview copy, mate. We'll get you on the podcast again to talk about it. But have you got a title for you, a working title? Yeah, it's Life on the Edge. And what I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send you the book cover on a thing so that you, you've got it. Uh, and what else are you up to these days? Because you got your own company, haven't you? Yeah, I spent 22 years doing corporate security, last 15 really, over in the, the Hague or in Monaco or in Nigeria before that with a company called uh, SBM Offshore. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Fantastic people. Great directors who made him mind out of blank canvas. So just as I joined the company, they had a massive piracy attack against one of their vessels and they lost somebody. Uh, another guy lost his arm. So they were, they were in a bit of a shambles state. So blank canvas. We managed to sit down with the directors and say, listen, you need, a, you need to change the attitude. So we brought in a security culture, second to none, really, because we never had a single security incident worldwide operating in some bad locations in all that time, which goes to show that if you've got good directors, good people that are willing to listen, um, then it works. And that's what we're trying to do now. So two years ago, I had a bit of a light bulb moment thinking I need something to pass on. So I started a company called Hawks & Co, which is obviously you need to be a Hawks to join. So me and my daughter, specifically, we teach kids how to stay safe on the streets, uh, personal safety, situation awareness training. My daughter is actually taught by James Johnson, who teaches all around the, the country, he used to teach all around the world, bodyguarding, teaches all the doormen. So she's been taught by the best of the best, if that makes sense. Uh, Lofty Wiseman advises her on situation of awareness and stuff like that legend yeah she's been pretty well tutored uh, if that makes sense so so she does all the breakaway stuff purely because when you're teaching kids they relate to her as opposed to me i do the scary bit as to why you need this when when we start doing breakaway stuff she does it uh because it's more believable for them he can do that because it's excess yes but she's doing it ah if she can do it then i i can do it so earlier on this last week, we did uh, a load of farm secretaries um, doing personal safety, rural situation awareness training. In two weeks' time, we're down in Cambridge teaching restraint um, and rural situation awareness training, personal safety to farm workers over in Cambridge because we're really getting into the farm industry um, because what we've noticed with the farm industry, the missing link between it all is the farmers and um and they're the key to rural crime. If you can get the farmers and the farm workers having a security culture, then you're on the way to defeating rural crime. And, and that's a big missing link. So the South West District Police Commission invited me to go down there to give a 20-minute presentation because they've identified that what we teach, which is changing the security culture, is that missing link. Uh, so personal safety situation awareness for corporate companies, we also teach active shooter uh, and uh, marauding terrorist acts uh, or what to do if you're involved in a terrorist incident. And the reason being is we've been doing that for the last seven years all around the world. So we've taught it in China. Uh, we've taught it in Malaysia, Myanmar, uh, over in Houston. What has the UK been doing for the last seven years? Faffing about trying to get mm. mines law, which is no further forward. Uh, so while they've been doing that, We've been out training and, and teaching. The way we teach people, it's not about 
having a police response. So we don't follow police guidelines because all the guidelines is all geared towards having a police response. Believe you me. Yeah. When you have a terrorist incident, it's done and dusted before they turn up. So the cleaner to the CEO of a company all know exactly what their role is and what they need to do. And, and our teaching is all about giving people options and, and you pick what you feel is the best option for you. And that's the same as when we do confrontation. You know, it's not your black belt in jiu-jitsu that's going to get you out of trouble. It's your personality along with the situation that will work for you. We're pretty, we're pretty down the line. We don't worry about hurting people. If somebody's intent on hurting you, believe you me, we're going to hurt you. Mm. Uh, because that's real life. The UK at the moment is very reactive in their mindset with security. We're going to have to wait for another Manchester arena uh, for people to get their act together. This Martin's Law that's just gone through the House of Parliament, but you're talking another two years down the line. So the next terrorist attack, that will supersede Martin's Law. And bear in mind that there are seven laws in place at the moment that cater for everything that Martin's Law is trying to do, but they're ignored. Um, and mm. so they're trying to bring in this new law, Martin's Law, to state the bleeding obvious. That's frustrating uh, because of the, the mindset of, of people. I feel your pain there, mate. I was head of security at an organisation and trying to get... You'd mention things like marauding terrorist attack and people would just clam up. And then you see other organisations invest in tens of thousands of pounds of these alert systems. And I'm saying to them, you're wasting your money because you need highly trained people to operate these, get these alerts out, and you haven't got the time. You need basic drills that people can remember in a panic. It's that, like, were you on the ranges as a soldier, either in the SAS or at 29 Commando, or as I was, it's all about muscle memory, training people to do things instinctively, isn't it? So when the fear kicks in, you act quickly. That people just... Britain's terrified about it. The, the, yeah. They don't realise it. They need to train people, and that will take the the scariness away. Yeah, yeah. I'd say what Pro proofs in the pudding, uh, as they say. Uh, so you know, we had 15 years of, of no security incidents. So that proofs in the pudding that if you've got a security culture, it'll work. We, when I was down in Monaco, we we taught um, the active shooter uh, and also what to do is you're involved in a terrorist incident rather than marauding terrorist incident, which is what the police call it. People in Monaco were a bit skeptical. You know, Monaco. I think it was down here. Um, then we had Nice, and a lot of our members live in Nice. Eight to seven people slaughtered by that guy in a truck, which just goes to show proofs in the pudding. If you can just remember, and, and this is what we tell people when we do the teaching, if you can just remember one little bit of what we're trying to tell now, and it keeps you alive and it keeps you safe, we've achieved the aim. But doing nothing is no longer an option. Yeah, absolutely, mate. What I'll do, Mick, is I'll put in your website address in the bottom of the show notes if anyone wants to click on your website they'll be able to do that direct from the show notes but as usual we're going to finish off with Desert Island Dits which is the guest choice of book, film and luxury item so what have you picked Mick? Yeah so book wise I, uh, I had a thought about this and uh, I had a book that I first took to Norway and it's Legionnaire by Simon Murray fantastic book and it was his life story about why he joined the because uh, he was a clever intelligent individual uh, and he joined the Legion and then went to second rep and had a, a fulfilling five years. And I thought that was a really interesting book to read. So you'd be glad to know, not an SAS book. <laughs> <laughs> He's a really uh, interesting character, though, because he fought in Algeria and then afterwards he became a, a multi millionaire because he fought, is it Glencore, I think, a, a big mining company he formed? Yeah, yeah. And he went, he went, he did a polar trek as well. So he's a very interesting character, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then film. So just after the, the Falklands, a film came out that we started watching called The Long Good Friday. Which oh, was, uh, yeah, brilliant film. Yeah, I love anything British because I think it's more realistic. So I, I like The Long Good Friday purely because it, it was our era, that early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, gangster style, <laughs> London gangster. And he just portrays it brilliantly. Bob Hoskins, uh, the lovely Helen Mirim, who starred in it as well. So she was the eye candy that uh, kept you on the screen. But I, I just thought it was a fantastic film. Uh, so. And I think it's capturing London on the turn, isn't it? Because a lot of the outside scenes are still the, the docks cranes are there. That's part of the plot. It's about redeveloping London, isn't it? Yeah. So. And luxury item? 
Probably a good backpack because we always carry stuff everywhere. Uh, so backpack on your back, you can chuck any shopping or whatever, away you go. Military mentality. And that's the first time we've had that choice, Mick. So well done. You've got an original light in there. Excellent, mate. So I'm going to recommend two books we've had on the podcast before. One I read way back in the day called, you'll be aware of this from probably, Faultless Commando by Hugh McManus. Yeah. It's about one freight in the Falklands. It's an absolutely outstanding book. It really captures the commando spirit. And also one freight battery who at the time, they sort of straddled that line between commando forces and special forces, didn't they really? They were sort of in the middle and they worked quite closely with Hereford down in uh, the Falklands as well. Really great book. And the other one was we did a podcast uh, early on in the series with my mate of mine, Jimmy Moore, who was with Three Para on Mount Longdon. And he recommended this book and I went away and read it. And it's absolutely fantastic because most books are written by officers about campaigns. But this book, Three Days in June, the incredible minute-by-minute oral history of Three Para's deadly faultless battle by James O'Connell, is a fantastic compendium of the battle from all the Toms, lieutenants, all the people who actually but right down in the nitty gritty of the battle. And it's an amazing book. I don't know if you've read it, Mick, but if you have, I really highly recommend it. Well, I certainly will do. I've, I've read Hugh's book, uh, purely because it, you know, it was the Falklands and it was a 2 night book. Uh, so it was a good read. So, yeah, I'll look out for it. That's it. We'll wrap up there. So, hey, mate, thank you for coming to the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, pleasure. Absolute pleasure, mate. It was, was good. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. And that's it for another episode. So thanks again to Mick, as I said, for coming to the podcast and to you, the listener, for your continued support and suggestions. Please keep them coming in. And our emails, social media links and links to Mick's website are at the bottom of the show notes. You can find us in all the usual suspects, including Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. And if you've downloaded us from iTunes and like the podcast, it'd be great if you could leave us a review there or anywhere you get your podcast from. And thanks again to Nick Beale for his continuing help and offering technical support for his company ISAR. And we'll see you next time on The Unconventional Soldier.